Dr. Shandana Khan Mumand uh, present some work, and then I'll invite uh, Dr. Yasser Khan to come up and present, and then Dr. Rabia Malik. And so with that, over to you, Shandana. Thank you, Soleil. And why I'm going first will become evident to you on the on the last slide. Um, but this is this is um, our attempt. Th this entire uh, team that's um, th our attempt to understand gender gaps in voter turnout in Pakistani elections. We've been working on this um, as as well one of the best collaborations I've had and the best times I've had working with colleagues. We've been working on this since about 2017. Some of the work, most of the work, is well now <laughs> now published. And I'll um, and this presentation pulls together findings um, from these different papers. So it's not one particular paper that I'm uh, discussing here today, but essentially looking across a few of them. And so I'll just run you through, and then of course any questions that you have can be directed straight to my co-author Sarah Khan, who's right here in the audience as well, and Ali might join us at some point as well, and then they can help me field all of the questions. So what's the big puzzle that we're trying to answer here? Why do fewer women vote in Pakistan's elections? Is that a fact? It absolutely is a fact. We've had the right to vote since the 19. Uh, 50, so there's really, uh, it's, it's not legal issues that have stood in our way, but right up to the last election, the 2018 election, this was well advertised, um, uh, the media covered this quite a bit as well, is that there were 11 million fewer women who voted in 2018 and that there were 12 million fewer women who were on the vote register in um, 2018 and that a lot of the focus wasn't getting more women onto the vote register, but the gender gap exists, and it's particularly severe in Pakistan compared to the gap that exists in our in our neighboring countries, for example. So there's so the the, the puzzle is fairly um, large. I mean, we can try and guess at some of the answers, but the the attempt in this um, research and in our effort here really was to try and figure out what it is that's going on. And I'm going to present to you the answers that we think we've come up with. Um, so. Uh, Part of, part of um, the puzzle also is the fact that we recognize that this has happened and there's been clear attempts at wanting to deal with it, uh, but that our ways of dealing with it have been fairly inconsistent and maybe incomplete. Um, so one of the m biggest measures that came through was the Election Act of 2017, uh, but the reason why it may not be able to deal with exactly the puzzle that we've set up here is that it focuses on registration, it focuses on why communities apply restraints, and it, it focuses on very extreme cases. Whereas what we're saying is that perha perhaps the gap that we're talking about here is, is, is a gap that doesn't fall into extreme cases. These are not districts where large groups of women are not turning out. These are just sort of women in households who are just choosing not to vote. And they exist in specific types of spaces. They're interacting with or not interacting with specific types of actors. So part of what we're also trying to get at here is what are the spaces and the actors that truly uh, that, that matter and where we might want to focus if we're interested in getting more women to come out um, and vote. So I am going to take the presentation in that direction towards the end of it. The three papers that we draw on one one's called the empty promise of urbanization um, the other one is invisible citizens and the third one is canvassing the gatekeepers so this this draws on all of them and I'll and I'll um, tell you where our findings are from each one of, of these papers and they all also are methodologically diverse we use all Pakistan secondary data in this one this one is based to a great extent on qualitative very deep work um, in um, uh, multi-sided work across Lahore um, city um, to get at why, what women are thinking and why they're not coming out to vote. And then we ran an experiment to figure out whether we could turn out um, uh, women to vote and increase their participation in politics. So I'll, um, and so we'll run through all three of these. Um, part of that puzzle that I'd set up at the beginning is the fact that women are not lagging on absolutely every indicator, right? So on, uh, if you compare women in cities to women in other parts of the country, we can see that they, they have a greater probability of a high school education, um, less probability of not having received any education at all, a lower dependency ratio, and um, um, a higher uh, empowerment index on a number of indicators. But the, 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 the part that's truly surprising about this and that really grabs most of our audience is, is the fact that 
on uh, when you compare women's participation in urban areas compared to other parts of the country that the gap here is larger than it is in other parts of the country. Um, so this is the yellow bit is women's turnout in 2018. What should be the blue, but does I'm not sure it quite looks blue here, is men's turnout in 2018. And the gap that you see there in the, in the largest metropolis in each province is, is larger than what you would see in other parts of, of the province. So clearly there's something about the city that, that works in certain ways or doesn't work in certain ways. And this, is and this is in that paper on what we're calling the empty promise of cities. So in terms of politics, cities are not managing to engage their female citizens. And this gap is consistent across all the provinces. So what you see here is the male to female turnout gap in 2018, the highest for metropolitan areas in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa compared to any of the others, but consistently across all provinces, they're doing worse in urban areas than in rural areas. And we, uh, we don't quite touch on what might be happening in other parts of the province, but I'm very happy to take that up in questions if you want to go in that direction. Um, and the point that we really need to make is the fact that this is not reflected by a gap, uh, by a similar gap in registration. So registration is really not what we're looking at here. And that's really been the focus of a lot of our drives is to send people out and register more women. But that's really not what we're talking about here. This is about the fact that when women are registered to vote, they're not coming out to vote or engaging with that um, process. Various sources of data um, that, that I'd already spoken about. We've got a survey here. We use the Herald SDPI 2018 pre-election nationwide survey, as well as our own focus groups and interviews. And I'm just sort of going fast because we've lost a little bit of time, but I also promise to try and stop at about 15 minutes. Um, Part of this, and this is really where we stopped the last session as well, is that maybe part of the answer sits in the fact that there is a real, uh, that there is weak mobilization and engagement between women and political parties. Uh, and maybe here is somewhere we can start guessing at the difference between urban and rural areas and the nature of engagement around politics um, and, and the, the nature of political engagement between political actors of various types, but very specifically political parties, um, their brokerage networks, people that they hire in, in um, well, people that they work with in neighborhoods, and the ways in which they engage with women. So the, the light blue line is women contacted by a party in the 2018, uh, 2013 election drawing on the Herald survey, and men that were contacted by the party. The gap for women is much larger in urban areas than it is in rural areas. And Sole, maybe you can comment on, on your own work on what family-centered clientelism looks like and why it matters in, in this context. But this is, this is sort of both how parties engage and whether or not political workers are working with them. And what I really wanted to uh, underscore in this is that we've actually shadowed um, a, a a campaign in Lahore in the 2017 by-election to see how this works, what the engagement with political parties is. So we usually say that political actors don't engage with, um, um, party workers don't engage with women, maybe there aren't enough uh, women workers, but a quite extreme case in this one was watching a by-election that, uh, that was between two women candidates. Uh, per, uh, Dr. Parveen Rashid and Kulsum Nawaz, and most of the people campaigning and contacting w uh, voters were women. That's me right there, very literally shadowing what was going on um, over over here. And the the it's it's so there is contact, but it's the nature of that contact. What messages are passing through, and how are they managing to engage with what? you know, whether or not they're able to speak the language that might be required to mobilize the vote. So there's clearly, it's not, maybe it's not just about the contact, but about something else that's happening in these households that we need a better recognition of as well um, in all of this. But political parties is a major part of that puzzle. Um, it leads essentially to what we're calling in that second paper that I, saw, uh, I listed at the beginning is the invisibility of women as political citizens in this country. And this is something that came through very strongly in our work, women, uh, uh, in our focus group discussions, women regularly referred to themselves as being invisible to the state and to political actors. So this graph here shows you as the dark blue line, women who think the union council chairperson uh, does not know them and the counselor that does not know them. And 
there's a real gap in that engagement, even at the local level. So this was at a time when local governments were, did exist and were active to some extent in these neighborhoods, and a real gender gap that we're able to see there. So it's a constant focus on, on what the gender gap looks like. And this also then starts to get us to understand that this space may be very heavily mediated by men. So if that's where the contact is happening, that's possibly also where a lot of the decision making is then happening and a lot of the decisions around political activities. Um, other ways in which we think that that invisibility matters uh, and manifests itself is that you can see that kind of a gender gap, again, between male males in dark blue, women in, um, um, in light blue, and the difference in how interested they are in neighborhood and service delivery issues, in political issues, and in political TV shows. So a real sort of disengagement of, of those invisible citizens uh, from the political process, and that is essentially sort of the signals that we now have of where we might, um, in, in the fact that we do need to re-engage our, our women. Wh how do, but, but sort of what is the sense of um, how appropriate it might be for women to be part of um, politics? And we see a real difference. So here, each time, and apologies for how small this is, but the dark block here is women, and the lighter gray block is men. And we ask them about um, how appropriate they think it is for women to discuss politics. So just look at the gender gap in each case and the levels of it. Discuss politics, not that uh, big a difference, but the levels are... are so and on, are also high. Attend a rally, neither men nor women, think that that's very appropriate. Stand as, as candidate, more women than men. Become political workers, more women than men think that it's appropriate and okay, but the level is, is not terribly high. But here, well above 95% of uh, women and 92% um, men um, that we talk to think it's absolutely appropriate to, for women to vote. Right, so the constraint that we see in them not coming out is not because there's any kind of a social norm that's attached to, women, uh, to that being an inappropriate political activity, even though the others, may, uh, other areas may well be uh, considered more inappropriate, but there is a really interesting gender gap to note in attitudes in each one of these um, cases. But voting, I mean, that's the really, uh, main thing that you need to hold on to right now for the next just two or three minutes, is that that um, gap does not exist in voting. But, so we think that we know that the political space is mediated by men, but we um, also have evidence within our own um, survey then of that, uh, of there being other kinds of gatekeeping, right? So now more and more we're trying, uh, getting to understand that there aren't really sort of huge uh, constraints on women voting maybe um, sort of, uh, but and yet we see those huge numbers and trying to look now inside the household on what might be happening here and we realize that there's gatekeeping in other spaces um, as well that affects women. So 60% of surveyed adult women need permission um, uh, to leave the house. Um, there is motorbike ownership, but, nine, but, but women don't have access to that. So 92% of households own a motorbike, but clearly as we possibly understand, whether it's a motorbike or a car, the ownership is not usually uh, with women. And a number of other areas that we checked on, on where we realized that there may be gatekeeping that's happening. So what we now know, I mean, just a very quick summary slide uh, of everything that's gone before, before I move to the experiment here, is that there is a large gender gap that's fairly exacerbated in urban areas that is mirrored by a gap in mobilization and political knowledge, that the household and the community, um, the, there is a general consensus on voting and that, that that is not where the issue is, and that there is a sense um, that there is gatekeeping, that it is, exists, that it exists inside households, and that the efforts that we've had, whether it's from NGOs, the Election Commission, um, is, um, or, or legal instruments that we've had, that, it's, um, that, that it hasn't been able to make a difference, that that's not where our answers lie. So what we did in, um, in, in this case was that we partnered with Aurat Foundation and South Asia Partnership Pakistan to, um, to, to run a voter mobilization campaign in 2,500 households in Lahore. And we randomized households to receive one of four different types of treatments. The uh, first group is that they receive no visit at all. A second group is that a female mobilizer visited and spoke just with women in the household. The third 
third group is that a male mobilizer visited and, worked and spoke just with men in the household. And the fourth treatment is that there were two separate visits by a man and a woman, um, a mobilizer, and, and speaking to men and women in the same household. And that's, it's the difference across these that we want to see in terms of what we're interested in, i.e., do, do more women then come out to vote? This was pre-2018, and we're looking at results of, the vo uh, of voting um, in the 2018 election. How do we measure um, that? We turned up in the two days after the vote um, had happened to check for, for um, whether they had the, the, the indelible ink mark on their um, fingers or not. This is largely because of concerns around over-reporting of whether you did vote or not. So we had to rush through this exercise um, in the first two days after that because our uh, qualitative work had also signaled to us that it washes off very quickly and it washes off quicker for women than for men because of household chores. So you have to show up fairly quickly if that's the measure that you're going to use of the outcome. What we did in these households was a combination of things. There was an, uh, We made sure that they realized that this was a nonpartisan exercise. Uh, we had a letter from the Election Commission who, support, um, who supported this exercise, so we had that letter with us. We made a five-minute video that talks about accountability relationships. If we'd had more time, maybe it would have been nice to have um, seen that. An information leaflet as well as a mock ballot exercise. So it's not um, the type of, of message that varies across households. It's really who receives the message inside each household. And the final slide then, is just showing you the results. So no effect for working for women working with women in households and delivering the message only to women. A 5% increase in women's turnout in the 2018 election when we worked with men, only men in the household, and an 8% um, increase. So given that initial um, difference of about a 9% gap, this is, this is quite, um, quite a major a um, uh, result of working both with men and women in these households. We think that this creates a framework, and this is why we, uh, I'm going first, is because we want to know where the, uh, the following papers think they might sit on this framework. And our framework essentially um, suggests that there's two conditions that might hold to what kind of a short term, what kind of an impact we can expect from a short term intervention. And when can we shift norms on, on issues such as women coming out to vote? And those two conditions are whether the attitudes and norms around the political activity are permissive or restrictive. And as you'll recall, we'd said voting was uh, generally considered, was, fell into the permissive um, group, and that, that was true for both men and women. And the second condition that we think that holds is whether or not you require men's uh, permission to engage, whether there's gatekeeping or not. And so ours falls into this space. The activity is constrained by gatekeeping from, uh, 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 from the way we understand it. Engaging men is necessary, and we were able to see short-term change that came from this intervention. If the activity had not required men, uh, men's permission, then clearly this is not the sort of intervention you'd require. But if, if the attitudes were restrictive, then maybe we need to think about different kinds of interventions, and then this is maybe not the space that you want to operate in. So it'll be really, I'm going to stop there, but it would be really nice to see if this framework works for um, the others that are going to speak after this today. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Yasser, and I'm going to be talking about gender gap because the session on gender gap. But we are going to focus mostly on norms and people's beliefs about those norms. This is joint work with Saad, who's sitting somewhere here in the audience, and also with Luke Sonnet. Um, the work is very much, it's kind of work in progress. We have already done one experiment, and based on that, we are trying to design another experiment to sort of understand what we see in the first experiment. The main question that we kind of are trying to get at in this work is that do beliefs about social norms affect women's voting, uh, and voting sort of in election and, and, and turnout? Um, why is it important that we focus on social norms? Just to give, I'm sure we all sort of kind of agree that social norms uh, affect our behavior when we are out in the society, but just to sort of still drive the point, uh, social norms act as a barrier, especially for women participating in activities relative to men. So it's, uh, social norms are a significant barrier when it comes to uh, participation in labor force, in labor markets, also in um, civic activities as well. Um, but in addition to 
uh, norms restricting participation in, um, for women in these activities, there is an emerging literature which also talks about the misperception of social norms. So norms are restrictive and then on top of that, people don't have correct information about those norms. And that adds to uh, this gender gap that we talk about in labor force participation, in, in political participation and all. Uh, so in this project, what we essentially want to ask in the, in the very first experiment is, um, is there misperception uh, regarding uh, whether women are allowed to sort of vote in, um, in elections? The second question we are interested in is that, um, can we correct that misperception if we provide them the correct sort of information and does that then affect women's turnout in election? Uh, and lastly, um, whose beliefs sort of matter? Um, looking at Shandana's uh, theoretical framework, do we need to talk about to men uh, so that women are allowed to go out and vote or do we need to just focus on women themselves? Um, why is it important that uh, women is, women participate in politics at at least the same rate as men? Well, because women have distinct policy preferences. It has been shown that women politicians actually take policy decisions uh, which are sort of different from, uh, from male politicians. This is work in, um, I think, in India and also Sarah's work shows that. Um, uh, also, women voters have different uh, preferences. So it's kind of very important that we bridge that gap to make sure that the whatever policy decisions that we take, uh, that the economic growth that we want, the, the development policies that we, uh, that we enact, uh, uh, sort of reflect what women of the society um, are thinking. So just to sort of set the stage for where we are working, we are working in KP. We are working specifically in Peshawar district. And KP, as you can see, this is data from Fafin for 2018 elections. The blue bar here shows the turnout um, um, sort of for, for, for men, and the, um, the orange ones shows for, for women. And there's a large gap. Uh, actually, KP has the sort of largest gap when we uh, break this turnout data uh, by gender. Uh, to address this gender gap, a lot of work has been done in Pakistan. And like this is probably not exhaustive, but just to the two main uh, sort of papers that have um, come out recently um, is by people sitting in this room, basically, uh, which shows that mobilization helps. Uh, if you go and try to get more women to turn out in elections, uh, it does help, and more women do turn out um, uh, in elections. Uh, but if we look at... Um, one thing that we sort of should, should take away from this is that this work is mostly focused on Punjab and Sindh. Uh, what we really want to do is focus on the area where the gap is largest, which is KP. So for that, we do this study in Peshawar. Now, Peshawar is a metro area. And as Shandana pointed out, metro areas have huge uh, gender gaps. Peshawar is particularly bad because when you look at um, female voter turnout in the most recent national elections, which was in 2018, uh, women turn out at almost half the rate uh, that of men, which is uh, at least surprising for many of us, especially even for those who live in Peshawar, that there is such a huge um, uh, gender gap. So in Peshawar, we focus not on urban areas. We work in villages because it's kind of easy uh, um, to sort of work there and understand uh, the dynamics there better. We work in about 37 villages um, around Peshawar. This is kind of the map. Most of them are clustered towards the, uh, I would say, northwest side of, um, of Peshawar. But we also have a few villages on uh, the uh, southern side as well. Um, so in, in this study, what we do is that we first want to understand people's beliefs about when, whether women should vote or not. And for that, uh, we send male and female enumerators to those villages. The male enumerators talk to men. The female enumerators talk to women. Um, and we collect some information uh, from them. Um, it's important that in these uh, 37 communities, we sort of do a census of beliefs, but it's not exactly a census because we only talk to the male heads of the household and female heads of the household. So for every household, we talk to the uh, woman who's responsible for the social relationships of that household and for, with man who's responsible for the social relationships of that household. And we ask them their own beliefs about women's right to sort of discuss politics in public gatherings, um, their right to vote in elections, and their right to run for uh, political office. 
but we also then ask them uh, about their beliefs about norms. Um, and we do, we do that in a very specific way. Norm is a, norms how to, and how to measure norms is a kind of a concept which is still sort of evolving in, in at least in economics literature. So that's why it's important to understand where we ask them in a very specific way about norms. We ask them out of 10 women in your village, how many do you think support each of these? And then we ask them out of 10 men in your village, how many of them support each of these according to uh, your beliefs? Uh, and our measure of misperception is that we aggregate everyone's responses to these questions and then compare with their responses to this question. So. Aggregate beliefs kind of gives us some information about what the social norms in the in this community are, and the, um, this tells us about people's beliefs about those social norms. And we find that there is basically mismatch. There's huge misperception about what everyone else in the community um, believes. So I'm going to show you some descriptive data of, of this mis misperception. The first is what women think and what others in the community think about their beliefs. So the first order belief is basically the respondents' own answers. And when we ask women, do you think women should uh, publicly discuss politics, 82% of them say yes. If they have the right to vote, 84% say yes. If they are able to run for office, 83% say yes. These numbers are slightly smaller than what Shandana showed you, um, in, but, but still 80% uh, plus, which is pretty good. Um, but when we ask other women to basically tell us what they believe other women in the community uh, sort of think about uh, these three parameters, we see that the number goes down. Other women think, so women think that other women in the community, about 63% of them support that women should discuss uh, politics. Um, about 69% of them uh, think that they have a right to vote and about 64% uh, uh, think that they, have a, um, they should be able to run for, uh, for office. We also ask uh, men uh, what they think of other women in the community and men's beliefs about other women are uh, then again sort of like um, a lot more pessimistic. Uh, similarly, we ask men what they think and then ask others uh, what they believe about men's uh, beliefs. So this is, we ask the respondents, 75% of men think that women should be able to discuss politics publicly. 93% of them say that women have the right to vote and 85% of them say that women should be able to um, uh, run for office. But Others, so if we ask women what uh, they think about men's beliefs, they think about only 58% uh, think that men uh, support uh, women publicly discussing politics, 64% think that men support that women have a right to vote, and 57%. Again, as you can see that the, the beliefs about others are a lot more pessimistic. Um, and uh, when you ask men, this becomes even starker that, okay, what other men in the community think? Only 40% of men think that their fellow men in the community support women's uh, right to sort of discuss politics, right to vote, and a right to run for office. This basically, sh I'm trying to show you that there's a huge gap between what individually everyone thinks and what people think others in the community are thinking. Another way to think about this and to see it is basically if we plot that, those gaps. So these black lines, I'm not sure if you can see them, these are at zero. So anyone here basically on these lines means that they have correct information about what everyone else in the community believes. But anything to this side is negative, means that they are very pessimistic. As you can see on all these graphs, pretty much 80% of people are very pessimistic about their fellow citizens, males and female um, in, in the community. So what do we do? Armed with this information and we got excited, we were like, okay, this is this is misperception and this basically seems to be uh, an information constraint that we can probably solve by going back to those people and telling them that, hey, we interviewed everyone and it turns out that everyone is a lot more supportive of women's right to vote. We focus particularly on voting uh, than you think. So we basically went back to those communities. It ha the communities have about 4,474 households uh, before the 2021 local government elections. The experiment got delayed because the elections kept getting delayed and all, uh, which is one of the risks of doing field experiments in Pakistan because you can never be sure about policy changes. Um, so we went to those households and we told them about what 
women and men in the community actually believe about women's right to vote. We randomize the order of men and women. Um, we also sort of kind of provide them correct information, true information, so, uh, um, so we don't, uh, uh, and, and the idea is that if you provide them to uh, true information, it may help up them update their beliefs and it may then result in women turning out at a higher rate. Importantly, we randomize who from the household receives this correct information, whether men, women, or both. Uh, and of course, we have a control group where we go and survey them, but we don't give them this information. Um, and in the, basically, we have sort of three sort of outcomes. One is where we see, we want to see whether they update their beliefs. Second, we want to see whether women voted, and this is done through, again, rapid survey uh, looking at indelible ink mark. And then third, we look, uh, we want to see whether they want to signal socially that they support women's right to vote. This is going to help us understand sort of the mechanisms behind what I'm, I'm going to uh, show you, or at least we hoped for. Oh, insufficient data. Okay, I was just trying to show you the picture of how we disseminated the information. So let me describe it. We actually went with um, sort of cutouts of, um, um, of, of cartoons and we tried to explain to them that, hey, these are 10 cutouts. We asked you how many of women supported um, women's right to vote. So we turn off like uh, those cutouts and um, we deliver that information through uh, sort of visual aids. But anyway, let me show you what happens um, or to their beliefs uh, based on uh, this information we provided them. So reassuringly, so uh, one thing I should clarify, uh, we could have asked uh, their beliefs the same way as we asked the question. Now, how, tell us how many women do you think support women's right to vote? Uh, but we thought that that could be, um, they could just tell us whatever uh, right, correct information we gave them. Uh, so in order to sort of avoid that kind of situation, we asked them to predict female turnout in the upcoming elections. And the idea was that that is kind of linked to their beliefs about uh, women voting. And if we see an update based on that, then that should sort of proxy for updation of beliefs. And we find that basically it, the, our information did help. So relative to the pure control households where we did not give this information, there's about two percentage points uh, more optimistic that women uh, are going to turn out um, in elections. And this is only for, uh, for women. Um, so we also see this for uh, households where we treated women there on, alone and all with men. There's no effect on men because this is done uh, at the time of survey. So they haven't had a chance to talk to each other and, and update. So this is very um, encouraging. Now, next we want to see what happens to the actual uh, turnout uh, in elections. And that's where the uh, sad or pessimistic part comes in. Uh, the treatment had no effect on women turning out and voting on the day of election. If anything, it has a negative sign. Um, it seems to um, have not done what we expected the treatment to do. But when we break down the data, um, Again, the, the, the sad or the, uh, the, the, the worrying result sort of becomes uh, more prominent. Uh, for households where we treated women only, there is a negative but non significant effect. When we treat men only, they don't really discuss anything with women of the household. So they take this information, they throw it away somewhere, and nothing happens. This is basically almost zero. You cannot distinguish from, from the control. But when we treat both, so when men know that we have gone and talked to women and they know what we might have talked to women, seems like uh, women turn out at a lower rate. So the, uh, the, the information, uh, if anything, reduced women's turnout in these treated households. Now we are, of course, um, uh, want to understand why um, did it happen. So one explanation, uh, which every economist likes to say for well, the very first time you show this, them this result is, oh, it's basically free riding. You tell people that other people support women's right to vote, and uh, that means they think, oh, I don't need to then go and take the costly action of voting because others are voting. If that is the case, then we have this other outcome, uh, which we take from Shandana and Sara and Ali Chima's work, uh, where we basically give them post-election a choice between two posters. One poster says this household supports women's right to vote, and another poster says this we just support women, uh, right to vote. And we ask them, do you want to uh, take this poster or, or this? And this is kind of a sticker, so they can. we tell them that you should display this uh, outside your household. And the idea is that if people are 
free, free riding, if the result is driven by free riding, uh, we shouldn't really see difference in terms of who chooses this poster because they should, um, uh, there is no reason for them not to signal because they are supporting women's right to vote. That's what they told us in the baseline. But what we find is that the treated households are actually less likely uh, to select this poster which, uh, which, dis which says that we support women's right to vote. They are, they are not willing to uh, not just select, but also they are sort of like less likely. The signs are all negative, though it's noisy, so you cannot see significance in other places, uh, all conditions. But they're also less likely to select, and less conditional on selection, they're also less likely to sort of display that poster uh, outside the household, uh, which tells us that probably the free riding explanation is not the one which is operative. So what is happening then? So this summer, I spent uh, quite a lot of time going to communities and talking to people, trying to understand what, what is that might have happened, which uh, got us this negative result. Um, and we got two broad classes of explanation. One is that men asked women on the day of election not to go out and vote. And why, why that might have happened, um, first explanation we got was that basically when, uh, due to the involvement of NGOs, so the enumerators that we sent were part of an NGO, uh, it kind of primed men to be concerned about their honor. Uh, that they thought that people in their uh, community are going to question their honor if they, the women went out and voted uh, after the NGO um, activity. The other one uh, that we found, which I think is very interesting, is that men got concerned that since we were talking about women's right, huck um, of, of voting, um, they were worried that women will try and basically exercise their agency and vote according to their own wishes. And that is something men don't like. They want to send out women for voting, but they want the women to vote according to the wishes of the man. And since we were talking about women's right and all that, they were concerned that basically uh, women are going to exercise their agency. The third explanation we got was that, okay, the women were probably, if there's no pressure from men, women were probably falsifying their uh, preferences because they were concerned about a small minority, but a powerful minority may sanction them if they went out and vote as a result of this campaign. So this is the next experiment that we have designed, which is going to go into the field soon, and I will hope that some, if, if you have any feedback or any advice for us, uh, it will be most welcome. Uh, we are first going to ask men uh, in a survey whether they were concerned about uh, their honor, um, just generally, whether they are concerned about their honor because of involvement of NGO, whether they are concerned about uh, their neighbors sort of questioning um, their honor um, in, a, in a survey form. Then we are also going to do an experiment with them in which we will randomly inform them that we are going to ask women to make a decision about donating to organization of a political activity. And we'll randomize whether we tell them that that political activity may include their political opponents uh, versus no discussion of political opponents. The idea is that if men are patriarchal in a strategic sense, that they want to control women only if they think that women are going to support their political opponents, then we should see some action um, in, this, um, in this experiment. And lastly, um, we also want to get at women falsifying their preferences. So we have in a survey, we asked uh, them a number of questions which sort of can be clubbed into the, um, this one line where uh, we asked them if they are willing to support the organization of this uh, political activity. Uh, and then we asked them that if we want to publicly acknowledge people who supported us in the organization of this activity, would you want your name to be included in that public acknowledgement, just to see whether um, the, uh, the possibility that their name will become public uh, makes them less likely uh, to support um, this activity. And I'm sorry I didn't add a, a thank you slide to it, but this is the end. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Rabia Malik for the final paper. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, I think, still. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you especially to the organizers, and it's always a pleasure to be back at LUMS, but also as 
Shandana and Yasser were presenting, like this is probably the most cohesive panel I've been on in my life, which is really, really exciting. Um, and I was thinking about how this paper, you know, sort of speaks to what both of you are doing, and that's something we will continue thinking about. Really excited today to also present some work in progress, which is joint work with Andy Harris on, of course, gender and turnout in Pakistan. And the broad question that motivates this project is how gender segregation at the polling station might affect political participation and why. So we're thinking also about norms and we're thinking about some of these constraints that women face, but we're particularly interested here in election administration choices and how that might also influence women's likelihood of turning out to vote. And I don't think I really need to convince anyone here that women's turnout is something that we should be concerned about or something that we want to study, but the motivation comes from this broad observation that we all know that women's voter turnout, despite improvements, remains low in many, many developing countries. And we also know increasingly that election administration choices help to shape political participation. So things like how far someone's polling station is, how hard or easy it is to get there. And one of these election administration choices that about a dozen or so countries have tried out in some way or another in the past couple of decades is having gender segregated polling stations. So stations where only men or only women can turn out at vo and vote. Um, and what we're interested in is, it's, it's, it's quite intuitive why such stations are introduced, and especially in socially conservative countries like Pakistan, it tends to make it uh, easier to, for women to turn out to vote. That might be because they feel safer, it might be because their families feel safer. Um, in focus groups, a lot of women talked about feeling like they wouldn't be harassed as much. And the UN also talks about things like having separate stations can also maybe help women exert independent vote choices more freely, uh, even if they're voting at separate polling booths in combined stations, you know, there still might be more influence of the family, how, how the head of household wants women to vote, and having these segregated stations can help in that way as well. And though there's some work now, um, recently, that looks at this, which we're also drawing on, uh, what the effects are of these kinds of policies, and especially why we have these effects or the mechanisms for what the effects are, are something that we think that we still don't have a very clear understanding about, and that's what motivates uh, this particular project. So what we're doing is we're using two different types of data from Pakistan to look at both parts of this question. We start off by looking at observational data that you know my colleagues also spoke about in different ways, uh, using the 2018 election data to establish a baseline kind of finding about whether gender segregation at the polling station has an effect at all on women's turnout um, versus you know, combined stations where both men and women can go to the same station and then vote in separate booths. And then, and we find, um, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not, we find that women's turnout is actually lower at segregated stations than women's turnout at combined stations. And then what we want to do is try to understand why that might be the case. So we've conducted a conjoint experiment in two districts in Pakistan. I'll tell you a bit more about that as we go on to better understand what citizen preferences look like over different polling station characteristics, and especially to try to focus on how individuals' turnout decisions are affected by the household, you know, very different from Western countries, which is where I've usually been presenting this, we, we know, again, from both of your work and lots of other people in the room as well, that especially for women, the decision to turn out is not necessarily an independent decision. It's very much constrained or dependent on um, other things, other factors in the household. Um, we're focusing on Pakistan because, in, I mean, it's a great context for many reasons, but in general, this is also empirically a difficult question to study, right? Because in order to look at the effect of a policy of gender segregation, you need variation in having both segregated and non-segregated stations in the same place. Lots of countries, voters get to decide uh, or get to sign up to specific polling stations, and it's also hard to find gender-specific voter turnout data at the micro level. All of these things work well in Pakistan, and of course there is a large gender gap in turnout, as we know. And so we have a nice mix of combined and segregated stations. Voters are assigned to polling stations, and then the 2018 National election was the first one where polling station level gender specific turnout data was available that we're able to use for the observational part. So just in the interest of time, I'm not going to delve into the very rich and exciting literature. Um, a lot of, you know, we're, we're drawing on again, so much work that's uh, being talked about here today, but I'll jump straight to kind of talking about why segregated stations might have this perhaps counterintuitive effect, uh, because again, the goal is to help it, make it easier for women to vote. So why might that 
not work in some cases, and maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And we talk in our paper about at least three mechanisms that could be driving this, um, if that is indeed the case. The first is to do with women's mobility. So segregated stations might make it safer for women to vote there, but the women actually need to get to the station in the first place. And so that works if either women are independently mobile or you can go with other women um, or in groups or in some way, you know, party organized transportation or something like that. Or it requires male family members to be willing to escort women to the station and then perhaps wait for them outside. And again, in the kind of context that we're talking about, both of these are kind of assumptions. They're not necessarily things, you know, we I think it's like an empirical question of whether the, these work or not, um, especially because if men have to facilitate that mobility, it imposes a cost on them, of course, in terms of the time. The second is to do with convenience, essentially. You know, maybe families vote together because it's easier to do that. It's something that everyone, it's like an election day activity that everyone does together. And so if there are segregated stations, this adds potentially a logistical cost, and that might affect both men and, and women, not just women's turnout, but also men's turnout then. And the third one is to do with sort of voter preferences, it's a little bit similar to what Yasser was just talking about. Perhaps men perceive that it might be harder for them to influence women's vote choice at segregated stations. Um, and if that's the case, then maybe they don't want to play a part in facilitating turnout at segregated stations. And um, we conducted a lot of focus groups as well, happy to talk about them more in Q&A, but we were trying to understand whether men and women did kind of pick up on some of the same things that we're thinking about when we're talking about segregation. In general, when talking about constraints on participation more broadly, men and women both talked about exactly what you would expect from the literature, exactly what you'd expect intuitively, you know, the same kind of constraints on women that are based on household responsibilities, distance to polling stations, security concerns. And when talking about segregation, the general sentiment that a lot of men talked about was that segregated stations were better because, you know, women could vote more comfortably. Um, and talking about themselves, of course, men don't quite face the same constraints. Most men had this uh, sentiment here in the quote where, you know, if they decide to vote, they can, they can go and vote regardless of where the station is, how bad the weather is, and so on. And women also had somewhat similar responses, but some of them did pick up on what we're thinking about as that sort of logistical cost. So, you know, there were some women who talked about combined stations actually being easier because then they could go and vote with their husbands at the same stations. But a lot of them talked about segregated stations being easier for them to convince family members to let them go and vote. Um, and, you know, at combined stations, young men tend to make us feel uncomfortable. So those are the kinds of things that we're interested in explaining more with the conjoint experiment. Before that, just very quickly to give you a sense of the observational data results. And there's, again, work, um, by other scholars as well who are using the same election to kind of establish a similar baseline finding that we have. This is just one of the results, but basically it, it encapsulates the main finding. Essentially what this figure here shows is that when we look at women's turnout, so the, the triangular coefficient, women's turnout at segregated stations is significantly lower than women's turnout at combined stations. This is um, significant across lots of different specifications. This in fact is the smallest coefficient because it's the most restrictive fixed effect. So here we have circle fixed effects. The circle is about between 1,000 and 1,750 households. It's the, it's the lowest level of fixed effect we can run because the census block is where the polling stations are decided. And interestingly, you can see that men's turnout at male-only stations is also a little bit lower. It's statistically significant, but substantively the coefficient is just over 1%, so it's a little bit smaller. Um, as I mentioned, we, we run this across a bunch of different specifications and find that women's turnout consistently is between 3 and 6% lower at segregated stations compared to combined stations. This is significant across lots of different things that we've tried. Men's turnout is also lower, but um, mostly significant, but substantively much smaller in terms of the size of the effect. And just a couple of things that we've looked at in terms of the robustness, we've done different levels of the fixed effect. Uh, we've looked at a specific kind of selection effect because yes, even though there's a mix of stations, of course there are going to be some parts of the country where you're very unlikely to see combined stations or very unlikely to see segregated stations. So we excluded all circles that have only combined stations or only segregated, so we're left with a small subset of uh, circles, so a small subset of geographical areas that have both types of stations, and we, we find essentially the exact same thing that I've shown you here. We included a measure for potential line length, and then just for robustness, because these are the two districts that we're focusing on in the experiment, Lahore and Kusur, um, looking at them separately or together, we have, again, the same baseline finding that women's turnout 
is lower at segregated stations, and to some extent that's true for men's turnout as well. Of course, what this data so far cannot tell us is why that might be the case, and that's what we're interested in with the conjoint experiment, to try to get a sense of what citizen preferences look like for different polling station arrangements, and also to some extent try to understand intra-household dynamics that might be affecting gender turnout. So just to preview, and I'll show you a bit more details about the experiment on the next slide, we had 2,500 households, and each we interviewed two people, so husband and wife pairs mostly, but also some proportion of father-daughter pairs, um, so daughters that were um, not married, living with their parents, but of voting age just based on the actual proportion in the population. And they were, again, visited by pairs of enumerators, male and female, so they were interviewed at the same time, but in separate rooms, um, because, you know, so to make sure that they couldn't hear each other. And this is drawn from four, eight, four and four different electoral constituencies in Lahore and Kasur. Um, there were three forced choice profiles. I'll tell you more about that on the next slide. The first two were randomized at the household level so that men and women were seeing the same profile but separately. And then the last one was randomized at the individual level. And so to tell you a bit more about that, essentially in the forced choice, respondents were observing profiles of two different hypothetical polling stations with a bunch of different characteristics um, that we varied. And they were asked after each round uh, which station they would prefer from the, for themselves and for their spouse, and then after the last round, which was randomized at the individual level, we also asked a bunch of what we call mechanism questions. So just essentially asking things like, you know, how safe would you feel turning out at that st the station? How independently could you vote? How efficient do you think the voting process is? So that we can try to get at, if we do find differences in preferences, we can try to get to some extent at why, you know, what exactly is, is, is driving that. Um, I won't go into much detail about the characteristics in the interest of time, but again, I'm of course happy to talk about that in Q&A. The main one that we're interested in is the type of station, um, which had three levels. So respondents were either shown a combined polling station. If it was segregated, they were told whether the segregated station that their spouse was registered to, whether it was very close or a little bit far from their station. Similarly, distance from home of their own station, whether it was close or far, the, uh, the likely wait time based on the line length, a short line versus a long one. And then we had the presence of party activists, election observers, and voter facilities based on what the Election Act talks about. So this is basically shaded areas to uh, wait in, drinking water, and toilets for voters. This is what the, um, this is what the sort of, uh, the, the, the forced choice looked like. This is where I usually say, I'm sorry, I know you, nobody can read this. Here, most people can actually read what's going on here, but uh, this is just to give you a quick sense of, we had very simple illustrations and a little bit of text because we're dealing with a semi-literate population. And in our focus groups, we did a bunch of rounds to kind of make sure that everyone was perceiving the, uh, the illustrations in the way that we wanted them to. So what do we find? Lots of things, but I'm trying to highlight a couple of the things that I th we think are most interesting and in in that interest, um, time-wise. I'm gonna start directly with the gender subgroups. I know there's a lot going on here, so let me just try to walk you through uh, what's, what's, what's really interesting. Here, the left panel, we have all our female respondents. Middle panel, we have male respondents, and then the third panel is just the difference between them. And of course, we have the different six different characteristics uh, and the levels, so for each characteristic, there's a baseline level, and then we're comparing uh, to look at the average marginal component effect. And if you run your eye kind of down the figure, the first thing that strikes you is that, well, men and women tend to have similar preferences across most of these characteristics. There's only one where they have significantly different preferences, and that's right down here, which is the type of station. So starting at the left panel, essentially the baseline that we're comparing against is segregated stations near one another. So compared to that, women in our sample disfavor segregated stations far from one another and are indifferent between segregated near and combined stations. If we look at men in the middle panel, again, compared to segregated stations near one another, men also disfavor segregated stations far from one another, but they have a preference for combined stations. And that difference is large enough that uh, the difference between men and women's response on this dimension is statistically significant. The only other one that comes close is the Q length, which is these blue sort of coefficients here. Both men and women disfavor long lines over short, fairly intuitive, but you can kind of see from the coefficient sizes that women have sort of a stronger preference, so to speak, and this difference is marginally significant. And if we look at the marginal means for the same kind of thing, again, it's the same two characteristics where women have a smaller tolerance for long lines than men, and men have a much stronger preference for combined stations. Now, 
we thought this was interesting, perhaps a little bit surprising, but so far we're only looking at men versus women in the sample. We haven't considered the fact that people, some people are in the same household and some aren't. So our thinking was, well, maybe men and women in general are different, but if we talk to men and women in the same household, then they will have the same preference. And so that's what we look at next, which is the household level disagreement, and we're looking at the marginal means here. Again, it's the same two characteristics that stand out. So when men and women in the household disagree over, if, so if they have the same preference, um, that's, you know, it's coded such that um, if they have a different preference and if the man has, uh, you know, man prefers a station, then that sort of shows up on this side and women have it shows up on this side. And we find the same two things. Even within households when they disagree, men tend to have a higher tolerance for long wait times which is perhaps, again, intuitive. Women much prefer shorter lines. And then, once again here, men have a strong preference for combined stations, whereas women prefer segregated stations. Um, and so the last thing that I'll talk about for the last couple of minutes is we're still working on trying to figure out why that might be the case, because the, our main thinking is, OK, so men's preference for combined stations is perhaps what we see reflected in the observational data, but why might that be the case? And again, we're drawing on some of the excellent work here. I'm going to draw on it more after today's presentations because I've, I've heard a little bit more about what everyone is working on. But we go back to the mechanisms that I talked about earlier. And we're still sort of, this is the work in progress. This is very much the work in progress part, but we, we think we have a couple of things that, 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 that are kind of interesting. So first, going back to women's mobility. Um, this is not something that we're able to look at like in the causal kind of framework with our experiment, but in the pretreatment questions in the survey, we asked uh, all respondents to, uh, a, a bunch of questions to make an index for their independent mobility. So whether they go out independently for work, for social activities, um, for household, like household chores, and so on. And we use that to categorize all our respondents as low mobility or high mobility individuals just as a first cut based on you know, how much uh, independent mobility they have. And we also asked them separately whether they turned out in the 2018 election. Now, of course, these, as, as Shandana also mentioned, there is overreporting, we're sure, because a lot more people seem to have turned out to vote in the 2018 election than we thought. Um, but as long as you know, that overreporting is consistent across the types of stations, uh, or across mobility, sorry, we should be okay. So we see something interesting. Comparing low versus high mobility men, there is a difference in their self-reported turnout, but it's relatively small, about 7%. For women, however, there's a much larger and much more significant difference where there's about a 20% self-reported turnout difference between low mobility versus high mobility women. So it, it, it definitely seems to be the case, unsurprisingly, that women who are not independently mobile in general turn out to vote less. And this goes back to thinking about the cost of facilitating women's turnout for men. And so we thought, okay, if it is really just about mobility, perhaps you can incentivize men to facilitate that by providing either some transportation or providing some kind of financial incentive for them to uh, have women turn out. So we had a small last randomization in the force choice before the last round of the force choice, where 70% respondents were not given an EQ. 15% respondents were told that parties were planning to organize transportation for women, so it's, if it's just about women getting there, then that might help. And 15% were told that the head of household would perhaps get a monetary reward if the entire household turned out to vote. And we find something interesting. Women's preferences, from those, these two treatments compared to the control, there's absolutely no difference in their preference over station type. For men, the party organization does not affect their preferences either. However, if they are given the financial, the monetary treatment, it attenuates their preference for combined stations such that they basically become indifferent between combined stations and near segregated stations, which we thought was interesting. And then the last thing is looking a little bit about this vote choice or vote preference. Now, very difficult to measure, we all know this. We're going back again to some of the descriptive part of the survey before the treatments and looking at two things. In general, you would think that voting at the same station might make it, e might make it easier for men to perceive that they have political control over women. We know that they vote separately in the polling booths, but you know they are going together. And so perhaps that influences how they think women, You know how much control they can have over the family vote. And so you would expect this to be more salient when men and women in the same household are politically different. And so we asked respondents to evaluate the current government at the time, uh, their performance on various issues, and we used that to calculate what we call the political difference between couples. And in line with what, what you know, in line with the mechanisms we expect, we see that high difference men 
do have a stronger preference for combined station. So, so we're thinking that when they think that their spouse might vote differently, they're more likely to prefer combined stations. And the very last thing with that, and I promise I will stop right after, um, is we know that women in general tend to make their voting decision more based on the household than men do. And I mean, that's, that's true in the literature, that's also true in our survey. But again, we asked women, we asked in the last election, those who turned out, were you at a segregated station or a combined station? We also asked which party they support. Women tend to usually support the same party as their spouses, but women who were registered to segregated stations in 2018 were significantly less likely to say that they supported the same party as the spouse. I was a little bit surprised. This is the last thing I ran, but it, 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 I, I thought it's really interesting. There's a 10% difference, and it's very um, significant. And we think, again, it's not a smoking gun, but it kind of points in the same direction of this vote choice or vote preference control that we're talking about. Um, to conclude very, very quickly, we're still kind of thinking about these questions, but it does definitely seem to be the case that men and women vary in the kinds of characteristics that they're responsive to. Um, men seem to have a much stronger preference for combined stations. Women tend to be much more indifferent towards the type of station. And this preference for men is even stronger when they are in what we call high political difference uh, households, but can become weaker when they're incentivized to maximize household turnout. Um, and maybe that's what's, again, reflected in the observational results, and we're still kind of working on the mechanisms, but there does seem to be evidence that's consistent with the kinds of mechanisms that we've been thinking about. I will stop here. Thank you all so much for your time. And so as you've probably all now seen, this is a wonderful set of papers that teaches a lot about gender and politics and that focuses our attention on inclusion and equality um, within the framework of the, the pathways to development that we've all been thinking about. And uh, you know, as has already been mentioned, these papers go incredibly well together and what they do is they really draw our focus to the role of norms and particularly the role of men in shaping and constraining women's political behavior. And so in the first presentation, we learned from Shandana that targeting men with information can loosen the constraints on women's political participation. We learned from Yasser that there are some limits to this um, and that sometimes information can backfire Though still, even in that case, we see that it is men who matter and that men who control women's behavior. And then Rambia showed us the role of institutions in also shaping political behavior and particularly the incentives and the costs that men and women face. But yet again, it's men's preferences that seem to dominate actual outcomes around participation. And so together, these studies seem to definitively show us that men are the gatekeepers of women's political behavior. And importantly, I think they provide us a theoretical framework to think about uh, that men are motivated in constraining women's political behavior by their own costs and perceived benefits to what women's action means. And the costs that we've learned about are social costs, the costs that they're expecting from violating some norm, the sort of physical costs of transportation and, and navigating all of this, but also their perceived benefits. If they think women are going to vote differently from themselves, um, they you know, have more incentive to constrain uh, and to restrict women's behavior. And so I think there's one really big question that this raises for me that I'd like to pose to the panelists but also to the audience as a whole, which is, you know, given this information, this is a conference about pathways to development, what are our pathways to inclusion? So the, the papers here have shown us that in a society with restrictive gender norms, sort of in, the, a potential pathway to inclusion is to find a way to align the incentives of men with greater inclusion, with women's political participation. And this could be done by increasing their perceived benefits from women's political participation or reducing their expected costs, such as by reducing their expected social costs. And I think Rabia at the end also showed us that when you increase their expected costs by for showing that they're likely to lose out on something, that also works in, in the reverse. But I think that this, there's a limit to this. At what happens when we hit the limits of this? What does it mean to be defining and thinking about pathways to inclusion within the framework of what makes men better off? Um, is there a way for us to conceptualize empowering women without 
purely catering to the incentives of men. And so I want to pose that as a question to the room. I also want to, the second sort of big question that comes out of this for me um, that re was really touched on in an important and deep way in these papers, but I uh, want to call for even more conversation around this, is you know, should we consider women to be agents of their own behavior, and is the outcome we care about participation or agency? And so here, most of our work is focused on moving this measure of participation and voting, but what does that mean if what most of you are showing us is that voting may be a non-agentic uh, behavior? And so I think that this is a question for our interventions and what kinds of things, and links to the question of pathways to inclusion. What is inclusion? Is inclusion parity at the polls? Or is inclusion freedom of choice at the polls? Um, but it's also a measurement question, as sort of was highlighted. How do we, in our research, think about capturing agency and what is even the right dependent variable we should be measuring and studying? Um, and, you know, for example, I think uh, I'm going to speak just occasionally to specific papers and then I'll share other comments privately. But I think, Rabia, uh, the, the institution you study seems fundamentally rooted in increasing agency by changing vote choice. It'd be really interesting. As you showed at the very end, um, it did seem to change partisan voting behavior. And I think really capturing those dynamics is important. Um, the, the last question that I will pose for this um, is for which women do these pathways to inclusion work? And so a lot of our work here has focused on averages, um, on how do we shift sort of the, the average voter turnout rate. Um, but whose political participation is increasing? Who are these marginal women who are being brought out to vote in these studies and because of these intervention? And importantly, who are not? Who is, being, um, who is most constrained or such kinds of interventions are not shifting? And so I you know, encourage the panelists here and others you know, in the audience and for all of us to um, explore the very rich data that you all have to think about shedding light on intersectionality and in all of this. And so to give an example, you know, uh, I was thinking about Yasser's paper um, and you know, I was wondering if there's a different mechanism that could be at play here, uh, which the question that I came up with, which is which men, which households are driving the negative effects of the intervention that you saw? Could it be that those with the most regressive views respond in the strongest way to try and shape community norms because they update very negatively? Um, and so can we learn something about the variance of how people believe and who at the community level are the gatekeepers? Um, and so with that, I will um, just say that it was uh, an incredible sort of privilege to get to read these papers. I'm going to open it up for the panelists to share any other thoughts, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, all right. uh, so I don't have something to say for all the questions, but thank you so much for the comments and these these broad questions. I think it's, I mean, they're great questions, but it's also, it's it's so easy to kind of get bogged down in the depths and the specifics of research sometimes that I think is really important to take that step back and look at these broader, you know, like what does this mean for empowerment? Um, I just wanted to touch upon the second question in particular about, you know, if women, is it about turnout or like about agency or something else? Because the way that we've been presenting this, um, <clears throat> is sort of, you know, there's this policy and it's meant to increase turnout for women, but but it doesn't do that. And so we've gotten this question before, like, wait, should the policy be scrapped? I'm like, I'm not saying that. But but then recently somebody picked on a different angle, which I think is similar to what you were touching on, is, well, is it about turnout or is it the women who actually, maybe not all women can now turn out at the segregated stations, but those who do, maybe they have a more independent vote choice. And so maybe that's like a positive then, maybe that's the point of the policy, is not just increasing the participation. And I think that links very nicely to the second, the, your last question of like, who are the people who are able to turn out or not? And I'm, I'm very sad that we don't have an answer to that because we, we did ask all those questions about the mechanisms. And so what we wanna do is look at when people pick the segregated station and then we ask them, you know, do you feel safer? Is it, do you, can you exert your independent choice? And those sorts of things. Do they actually pick up on those things? Because then that would lend a little bit more credence to this, this, this possible mechanism that the agency increases. And so 
I'm glad that's something that we will be able to answer. I don't have an answer yet, but I, but I hope that yes. But I, I really like this idea of thinking, because I was very negative sort of in terms of, wait, the turnout doesn't actually increase. So what, are, what are we even doing here? But it's nice to think about this from the other angles. Thank you. I'll, 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 I thank you very much for like basically synthesizing everything and raising these very important questions. Uh, and also thank you very much, Shandana, for giving that framework in the very first uh, presentation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at the first uh, question, which is um, given this, that the information isn't working, what's kind of the pathways uh, to inclusion? Um, I don't want to say something that's not very palatable, but uh, let me just, I guess, say it. Um, so one of the things that I've sort of like started realizing and after talking to people, uh, and I'm talking, I'm, I'm saying this in the context of a very restrictive uh, sort of environment where we did our experiment, which is a very restrictive environment. Um, so it may not be applicable to rest of the country, but sp I think uh, at least to the context where I worked, um, it's it's very much I think uh, uh, probably the 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 path ahead is to sp probably aim for the second best option. Um, so the first best option is we basically try to bridge the gender gap in turnout, try to bridge the gender gap in exercising agency. Women should be allowed to uh, exercise their agency in whatever um, decisions that they are making. Uh, but if we take that approach, then we really risk uh, not really uh, creating a pathway to inclusion for women in those contexts. Because as we see, there is a risk that there is going to be a blowback. Um, and if, so we have to be probably cognizant of that, and I hope that the next part of my experiment sort of sheds light on, um, on, on this and trying to identify what other second best options we have towards inclusion uh, when we think of a very restrictive or conservative society or society that has it's probably overall not very conservative but has very restrictive norms when it comes to women's participation in, um, in politics. Regarding your specific question, that's something uh, we're still exploring what other mechanisms may be at play. Um, the, it didn't matter how pessimistic you were at the baseline uh, for, for the effects, which is very surprising uh, for us. Um, it does matter if you were pessimistic, um, then, uh, uh, but, but like the degree of your pessimism at baseline didn't exactly, uh, didn't exactly matter. It also didn't matter something which I didn't show, but uh, from the descriptive results, we also, the, the goal of the experiment was our initial hypothesis or, or at least expectation was going to increase turnout and this belief updating will probably happen in social networks. So we have very rich social network data and uh, we were hoping that maybe based on whether uh, women who are at the center of the society rather than periphery of the society, maybe we can see something there and the women who are center of society are probably more empowered. Uh, unfortunately, that's also not the case. Uh, so. Uh, that's why I, I mean, I'm, that's why I, I think probably in, in the context of very restrictive, very conservative societies, we'll probably have to aim for the second best options. Yeah, and that change comes from wherever we can find it. But what, what really struck me about this is the extent to which gatekeeping is alive and well, even inside the polling station. Um, so I was just wondering about what the mechanism is through which it works inside the station at the time of voting. And that's, that's a really interesting part of yours. But I really liked what you said, um, um, Sole, about the fact of focusing on agency as a dependent variable as well, and, and what sort of work we might be able to do in that area, and when, at which point, do we move beyond all of these restrict, uh, restrictions and constraints to see where we're able to build women's agency, and we don't, um, I, I don't think, I mean, unless our co-authors want to step in here, I don't think we have a direct answer to that yet, but there's other work that we're doing where we're trying to focus specifically on this because the answers really have to come from the level of organizing, to, uh, of, of, of mobilization, and of involving political parties in, in that. So I didn't get into the details of the sort of mobilization that we saw in the field, but it's very much focused on, on asking for the man at the door when you turn up, um, scolding women for not having an ID card, 
um, sort of, you know, b lots of uh, shaming practices into why are you not coming out to vote and this is really is your, is your responsibility rather than a right. So a lot of sort of the ways that we send those messages, but much longer protracted organization, uh, organizational work and mobilizational work that's required. But just um, also to say that we, we've looked at a lot of the stuff that comes from households, right? The constraints that comes from households. But what I really liked about your um, uh, work, Yasser, is that you're looking at the constraints that emanate from society, which is which really ends up binding them. But we heard yesterday about constraints that come from markets. And of course, we've been talking constantly about the constraints that come from states because they don't have that supportive network. And uh, we're looking at a little bit of this, of the severe backlash that women face across all of these spaces. And just to sort of stop on a positive note is the fact that we notice that women face the backlash, but women's groups do actually re-strategize in the face of that backlash to find a way of continuing. So instead of it ending there, there is a re-strategizing that does happen when you face that backlash and figuring out where your allies are and what kind of organization and mobilization is, and collective action is required in that moment. So maybe next year's conference, we'll be able to bring you that paper because it's very much a work in progress right now. <laughs> I could ask a million more questions, but I would like to turn it to all of you. Now that we can open for some questions and maybe we'll collect a few. So how about we start here and then we can go. Okay. Um Um, just reflecting on uh, what uh, I heard about uh, gender and labor markets and then today gender and politics, I think there is a very common theme running uh, across the research that is being presented on uh, Pakistan relating uh, the decision-making patterns of uh, women. And I think... Uh, uh, this is a very important takeaway uh, for me, um, uh, you know, who's not a political scientist, but uh, just the commonalities of the discipline, uh, various disciplinary researches that are throwing light on why women are not uh, able to make decisions independently of uh, whoever is canvassing, uh, whoever are the gatekeepers, uh, be it you know the right to vote or uh, the right to join the labor market or to demand a salary, uh, which is commensurate with their um, capabilities. So um, now, how does this lead you to asking the questions uh, regarding modalities of political engagement uh, with women in terms of uh, evoking uh, this consciousness about what they should get out of the democratic process. Because I think sometimes we get too um, engrossed in trying to invoke the right to vote as to where is it leading uh, to for men, maybe it's a more clearer pathway that you know they expect some some outcomes from the person who's asking for the right to vote. But what are the women? What is the women's ask? And also the latest floods have brought this out so clearly that the women are screaming. Uh, that you know the people who come uh, to ask us for votes, where are they now when we are drowning and dying? So you know, I, I think this is a point where we really need to uh, di delve deeper into this. Uh, Rabia, I want to ask you: when you say segregated, is it geographically segregated, or in, for example, like in Islamabad, they have segregation within? a polling uh, station, so the women arrive with the men and then they diverge into different uh, uh, locations within the same uh, geography, so just to understand better. Thank you. Answer the clarifying question? Yeah, so while we're moving to the next, why don't you answer the clarifying questions? Just there was right here, yeah. So but go ahead, Rabia. Just to answer the, uh, the, the, the coding question, so um, I mean, essentially, we base it on how the election commission, like whether they call it a segregator or not, but that's not a great answer. Um, so they do have exactly what you're saying. So sometimes you have the same building and it's the same station. So you enter together and then separate in separate rooms. Sometimes they have like, if it's a big school, they'll have separate entrances. So you'll enter versus, and those are often 
segregated, like those are separate stations. We did code a variable based on the addresses that we have to look at, okay, maybe it's segregated, but it's actually in the same place, and we would expect that not to have, you know, that should act like a combined station. You still find a difference. Um, it's smaller, but even if they're in the same place but have those separate entrances, that still has a slight negative effect on, on women's turnout um, compared to the same entrance. Right, yes, we talk about it in the paper a little bit, but, right. So let's right. collect two more questions, and then, unfortunately, I think that's all we'll have the time for. So one here and one over here. Right. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. Um, so just to qualify my question first, I'm not an experimental economist. I'm more of a time series econometrician. So from that perspective, uh, would uh, any of you have, in your work have come across how the gatekeeping is evolving over time in the sense that is, is the general de development that is taking place in the society or general evolution with you know, education becoming a little bit more accessible to women, is that whittling away at the gatekeeping uh, power that men hold over women, especially, I guess, it would be more true for the more metropolitan areas. Great. Thank you. Great. And then one last question over here, sir. Wouldn't it be uh, actually a better instrument to say what others think? think? Because I, I think there's a sort of a, uh, almost a philosophical question here in terms of individual behavior. Does individual behavior in Pakistan really is your behavior versus what you think is the social norm? So you're going to behave according to what the community thinks. So I think that there, there's a sort of a methodological uh, issue there. A second methodological issue in terms of your context is the larger poisoned water in which you're operating, which is, when it came to me very clearly when you talked about that sticker to be poured, ke bhi aurton ko bhi hona chahiye haq. This is, this is, isn't it somewhat TPP territory that we're talking about, or interest, uh, I mean, some impact of the tariq taliban or just overall sort of a highly politicized, uh, um, verging on danger if you publicly sort of give this notion that you are, you know, for, for right, right uh, uh, women's right or something. So just that context, like, you know, how do you, uh, the larger context. The other, just last thing, I'm stuck by the lack of class here. I'm not, inter you know, maybe it is there in your, you know, Pacific papers, but in terms of thinking about gender, and uh, intersectionality you talked about, but uh, you know, are we separating out uh, education, urban? One just last thing. So the thing for all of you to really observe anecdotal evidence, there is a larger gap emerging uh, uh, in terms of women, larger women supporters for, for uh, PTI during this last three, four months. Uh, than some, you know, uh, separating from their male. So that would be an interesting, in terms of agency, to really explore for next election. Okay, thank you. We have just a couple minutes, so I will feel free to answer whichever of the questions moves I, you, and, uh, but I'll give each panelist one final I'll, word. I'll, ask, uh, I'll answer these two questions. Uh, when we ask them about what others in the community think, when we give them a number of 10, that's what we are trying to get at. Like we're trying to get at their perception of what social norms is, uh, norms are, and uh, we need to restrict it to sort of 10 to make it sort of easy for them to understand what the question is about, not to take wild guesses, but so that it's all comparable across. Um, regarding a question on um, whether it's a TTP territory or not, I would, I, I, I would say that uh, we should separate out uh, some of the uh, cultural nuances of areas from the um, uh, from the um, emergence of terrorist groups in certain areas. Uh, uh, just because an area is uh, culturally conservative doesn't mean it's a TTP territory. The, they are usually the people who have suffered at the hands of TTP, and I want to give credit to women in those areas. They still go out and vote. Uh, they're still campaigning of, that's being done by women canvassers. Um, there are still women candidates running for some elections, very few, uh, a lot fewer than what we would want, but they're still there. Uh, but they all live in a cultural context and they all have to take decisions in those cultural contexts. And that's something uh, we as researchers, I think we need to sort of like take that into account uh, and 
and try to whatever we want to do to improve the gender gap uh, to make sure that the goals that we set for ourselves are sort of not completely incongruent with those cultural contexts. Rabia, do you have any? Almost out of time, and I already answered a couple of things, Ajanana. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, just, um, just very quickly on, on um, a few things, but just finishing very, very quickly. Um, Modality of political engagement, I completely agree, and especially in terms of representing. I mean, Sarah's work has looked at this um, for, for a while now, is that if they're in, and our own sense of why invisibility matters, as if you're not going to know what they want, you're certainly not going to have those in your policy agendas, and, your, and, and who's making decisions for whom, and how do you know what they want, so clearly it all rests on that, and that's the sort of engagement that I've already spoken about, is that we're not getting in that process, and certainly need to push um, for that, and the more that we can involve political parties and look at all of this, that that would be absolutely um, fantastic, and I think, um, I think, I mean, that's, I, I don't, uh, gatekeeping over time, and we haven't sort of, you know, longitudinally um, uh, looked at that, but clearly a lot of the changes that we're seeing have happened where women have gained, but this is not the space in which they've gained, but to what extent that shifts. There's a little bit of evidence that I have for that from rural areas, is that it shifts, uh, it shifts repeated elections and predictable elections shifts the logic of politics and of organization. And so a lot of distortion, as Leonard was talking about earlier, <laughs> comes from the lack of predictability of an election and the way in which people engage then politically with those actors and that that repeated interaction really matters between voters and and political parties yeah. okay. great well let's give one last round of applause to the panelists for a wonderful session okay. thank you all <laughs>